We're going to give a real brief general overview of the circulatory system, and then we'll focus mainly in this presentation on compensatory mechanisms of the, how the body maintains blood pressure. So this is the heart. You can see it's pumping and the coronary arteries come off of the aorta. This is oxygenated blood coming from the left ventricle and it feeds the coronary circulation, feeds the myocardium, which uses about 5% of the total circulation. So it's a pretty blood rich heart. And here's an internal view. Deoxygenated blood comes in through the vena cavas into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve and into the right ventricle and out through the pulmonary semilunar valve out to the lungs. It's oxygenated, comes back into the pulmonary veins on each side, into the left atrium, through the mitral or bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle, and then out the aortic semilunar valve to go out to the body through the aorta and aortic arch. These go to the head and arms up here. This descends through the, the aorta descends through the mediastinum, pierces the diaphragm and feeds the rest of the body. Just a couple of features here within the heart. The atrioventricular valves have these chordae tendinae held by the papillary muscles. These are actually very thin, these AV valves. And so when the heart squeezes to move blood, uh, you would think these would flip backwards. And that's the purpose of these kind of heart strings, I call them. Uh, the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles is to keep those from flipping backwards. If the heart squeezes and this valve doesn't seal and it does flip backwards or leaks backwards, then you're kind of recirculating the same blood. Um, you know, some of it's going to go through, but some of it's going to go backwards. Then the heart is working very hard for not a lot of output. Notice that between the two sides of the heart, the left heart is much thicker in the myocardium. It's pumping to a much bigger systemic system. Therefore, it has to generate a lot more um, pressure to move the blood through the big system. The right ventricle is a lot less muscular. And then here we just add where the aorta goes out to the body. Body uses the oxygen, sends it back, which we said before. Then the right heart pumps through the pulmonary vascular system to the lungs, oxygenates the blood, and then returns it to the left heart to get pumped out to the body again. Now, when the heart squeezes, it sends out a pulsation of blood. And this is pretty interesting. Uh, it ejects a bolus of blood and that goes out. And as you can see on the left picture here, that generates the pulse. On the right picture, it shows more of the uh, close-up of how this happens. And when the vessel is just sitting there um, resting, that blood does exert a pressure, just like in the lungs, you know, um, air held in the lungs exerts a pressure, you know, when we get a plateau pressure. And uh, when the heart is not squeezing and that bolus of blood is not passing through that vessel, that blood does exert a pressure and that is the diastolic or at rest pressure. And uh, then when the heart squeezes, it ejects that bolus of blood out and it creates the systolic pressure as it passes under. So that's the difference between the two. So if you look at the pulse pressure, which is the difference between systolic and diastolic, you should have, you know, a decent difference between the two, a very small ejection of a very small bolus of blood out of the heart will create a very small wave and not very much pressure difference. Um, but if it's got a good strong squeeze, then it should uh, increase the uh, the diastolic by about 40-ish, and that gives you your systolic. Now, just like if we you know, push gas into the lung, if we push a tidal volume into the lung, it's going to generate a certain amount of pressure, uh, the same with the blood. But if we push a tidal volume into a stiff lung, the same volume, it's going to generate a lot more pressure. Same here. If these, you can see on this right picture, when 
the blood passes through here, those those vessels kind of stretch. They're compliant. They have some give. What if that injection of blood tried to pass through very stiff vessels? Maybe they have, um, you know, vascular disease, arteriosclerosis, you know, something like that. Just like the the ventilator trying to push a, a tidal volume into a stiff lung, and it generates a lot of pressure. If the heart is having to push a bolus of blood through a very stiff blood vessel, it's got to generate a lot more pressure. It's got to generate generate a lot more work, and so that's that's bad. And the heart and the lungs, uh, we don't like a whole lot of work or a whole lot of pressure because pressure is damaging, and work leads to fatigue, and fatigue leads to failure. And so the blood circulates and should maintain pressures within these ranges. And if you want to, um, you know, take a look at this for a little while, go ahead and hit pause. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but it just shows you the different pressures in the circulatory system. All right, let's start into the compensatory mechanisms. The first one I'd like to talk about is one that compensates for small differences between outputs in the right and the left heart. So if you think about it, we've kind of you know, expanded the circulatory system out here so it's very linear. And both sides of the heart have to pump the same amount of blood, otherwise one will back up. So if the left heart is not outputting as much as the right heart is putting into it, then blood is going to get backed up or congested in here. And it's going to back up, back up, and back up. It'll eventually get to the right heart, and then the right heart will get tired and it will fail as well. Um, problems in the lungs can create extra workload for the right heart and it may fail. Um, so if for whatever reason the outputs are not the same, then initially at least they're going to have, you know, maybe a small backup. So let's talk about this. Let's say that the left heart is short term, slightly less output than the right heart. The right heart is going to end up pushing more blood in and this will stretch the left heart and there is this thing called starling's principle that says that the more you stretch an elastic body like the heart the harder it will snap back so if the left heart is slightly outputting less than what's coming in from the right heart it will actually stretch this out more because it's got more blood going into it and it will cause it to snap back and hopefully make up for the little bit of difference in the two outputs, Starling's principle. So it's just physics, more stretch, the more squeeze, the more snap back. So uh, it can compensate for small differences. Now let's talk about short-term control of blood pressure, cardiac output, there are baroreceptors in the carotid bodies and the aortic arch. There we go. And they are sensitive to pressure. So if there is uh, less pressure because there's less circulating volume, there's not as much blood pushing, uh, they will send a signal through the 10th and the 9th cranial nerves up to the brain and because everything works that way in the body, signals get sent to the brain and the brain responds. So signal gets sent up and the brain can release norepinephrine, which causes some vasoconstriction. And anytime you constrict a vessel around the blood that's in it, it's going to raise the pressure and it will increase the heart rate and force of contraction, which will increase the cardiac output, which puts more circulating volume out there. So short term, Signals get sent through the, uh, the aortic arch and the carotid bodies through the ninth and 10th cranial nerves. So it tells the brain, hey, we need some help out here. Brain goes, no problem. Send you some norepinephrine, slightly constricts, makes the heart beat a little faster and a little stronger and can increase the blood pressure and circulating volume. So that's uh, very fast. The heart can increase its output very quickly through sympathetic control. And in this other picture here, uh, it's just another kind of view of it. You've got the carotid and the aortic arch. They send their signal, and then the brain sends out the sympathetic signals here. And 
it has its effect on the heart and the circulatory system. And then down here, uh, just to, I, I like that they put these together because these show the chemoreceptors that are in the same spot. So make sure that you differentiate between baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. Baroreceptors sense pressure, chemoreceptors sense pH, pCO2, and O2. And those would be uh, for your drive to breathe, the, the ones down here on, on, on picture B. Now, let's say that you have a profound loss of circulating volume, or it's kind of long-term, uh, the shorter-term mechanisms aren't working, and it's so much so that the kidneys get underperfused, because we know that when you have a loss of cardiac output that is significant enough, the kidneys don't get perfused, and that's why a lot of our patients have renal failure, just from loss of circulating volume. What happens when the kidneys don't get perfused is this system called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system kicks in. Now, if you think of what actually stimulates this, it is that low cardiac output, blood pressure, underperfused kidneys, and so the kidneys get stimulated to initiate the system. And so there's different parts of it, and they're pictured here. And I've kind of inserted some notes into this picture. Um, so the kidney secretes a substance called renin and renin changes to angiotensin 1 and then with the help of angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE changes to angiotensin 2 and causes vasoconstriction and so remember what our problem is we have loss of pr uh, blood pressure loss of circulating volume and so that part of the renin angiotensin system causes vasoconstriction and so that increases the blood pressure, and that's what we need. The adrenal cortex also secretes aldosterone, which directly causes urinary um, retention of sodium. And one of the things we know about sodium is that water follows it. So if the body is retaining sodium, then it's also going to be retaining water. And we know that when we have uh, fluid retention, uh, you know, if you think about what stimulated this, it's loss of volume, loss of circulating volume. And so the body's uh, making an attempt to keep the volume that it has by retaining sodium and therefore water. And so there we go. We have increased volume and pressure. Then we have this substance called antidiuretic hormone. Uh, diuretic uh, causes urinary excretion, but this is antidiuretic hormone and um, it is secreted by the pituitary, and it will actually cause urinary retention, which, as we already said, helps us to restore circulating volume. It also is um, called vasopressin, which has vasoconstrictive activities. So that antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, can cause vasoconstriction and urinary retention, and there we go, increase volume and increase pressure, which is our original problem. Then we have this guy here, the hypothalamus, and it tells this person that they are thirsty. And so when you have the thirst response, your tendency is to drink. And there you, know, you go. If you drink uh, water, then you're going to increase your volume and hopefully increase blood pressure. Now, lots of good stuff here. This system is stimulated by loss of blood pressure and circulating volume, and it is good if we have uh, absolute volume loss. So if we you know, actually are low on total blood volume and we're dehydrated, you know, blood loss, whatever, this will help restore volume and blood pressure, and that's good. But if we have heart failure, now if we think about that, we have not lost volume, we've lost circulating volume because it's being held up in the left heart and backing up into the lungs. So it's not being output to the body. So this system would be bad because the body during the example we're giving is left heart failure. It's not outputting because it's got, it can't keep up with what's coming into it. And now the body is making an attempt to uh, retain more volume 
and it's already unable to handle the volume that it has. So that's why if you think about it, we will give, when people are in heart failure, we will give drugs to um, vasodilate to decrease afterload and therefore decrease the workload on the heart. They usually give diuretics to offset this uh, retention and to get rid of circulating volume so that the heart has a more manageable workload. And our patients in heart failure are very thirsty. They are always trying to get water um, and they're usually in fluid restriction for this reason. A couple other things um, during this system, BNP is elevated. And so that's one of the lab tests that they do to determine if somebody's in heart failure. Um, remember I talked about you know, giving some vasodilators, a lot of times they'll give ACE inhibitors for heart failure um, because that will inhibit ACE and therefore offset the vasoconstriction, cause a little bit of vasodilation, which reduces afterload on the heart. So we have this system, again, we have this system that is really good for absolute volume loss. We've got not enough circulating volume in in the body and uh, it works well but uh, just to review in heart failure we're going to offset this because we do not want them retaining a bunch of fluid and creating a lot more work for the heart so give ace inhibitors diuretics fluid restriction things like that hopefully that helps you understand the body's control of blood pressure and compensatory mechanisms.